name is Shivani Gupta, and I'm a student with the University of Washington Engage program. I will be talking about the keys to better medicine on May 6th at 7.30 p.m. I get this opportunity because of a special cooperation between Town Hall Seattle and the UW Engage program. Together, they put on the UW Science Now Speaker Series as part of the Science Lecture Series at Temple. And now for our guest. Julianne Pinta is a PhD student in the Nursing Science Program and a research assistant in the Department of Global Health. She holds an MPH in epidemiology and is a registered nurse. Her research focuses on the prevention of HIV and STIs and maternal health and child health. Please give a warm welcome to Julianne Pinta. Thank you, Shivani, for that nice introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming out and supporting us this evening. There are three main things I'd like you to walk away from my talk with tonight, and they are to learn a bit about and appreciate the rich and colorful history of syphilis, and two, to understand why scientists and others think that male circumcision may prevent sexually transmitted infections among sexually active people. <laughs> and most importantly, I really want you to understand how we conduct scientific studies to investigate these types of questions. But before we dive into the fun stuff, I want to be clear about what I will not be presenting about tonight. Now these guys have great outfits, way better than mine, and they also have some very important points. However, in the interest of time, we are going to focus on the history and science of male circumcision tonight, and I'm happy to discuss the social and human rights implications later. But we'll be focusing on adult medical male circumcision as a voluntary public health intervention from here. Syphilis is a disease that has traveled through human populations for hundreds of years. And currently, at any given moment in time, about 36 million people are infected with syphilis worldwide. Although rates of syphilis have been reduced in recent history overall, it persists as a public health problem in some areas of the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa, where women are more affected than men. Additionally, each year there are over one million cases of syphilis transmitted from mother to baby, known as congenital syphilis. And this often results in severely disabling and even life-threatening infections in newborns. These kids are very sick and they often die when they're born in low-income settings. Additionally, the area of the world most affected by syphilis is the region most affected by HIV. And we know these diseases have a synergistic effect on one another. Among individuals infected with HIV and syphilis, immune function is further reduced and HIV viral load or the amount of HIV virus circulating in one system is also increased. And this has implications for the health of people living with HIV, but it also has implications for HIV transmission because HIV infected people are more likely to transmit HIV when viral loads are high. Also the risk of acquiring HIV among HIV uninfected people with syphilis is increased. Therefore, syphilis has important implications for both people living with and without HIV. And that's kind of where we are today in terms of the global landscape of syphilis. But the story of syphilis starts a lot earlier on a different continent. This handsome gentleman is Cesare Borgia. Has anyone in the audience heard that name before? Maybe some Renaissance scholars in the crowd? Well, he was a young cardinal and the son of Pope Alexander VI during the Renaissance. Syphilis aficionados will know him as the first celeb to get syphilis, but historically he was known for his ambitious rise to power and his striking good looks. And he's still pretty good looking today as portrayed on Showtime's The Borgias, which depicts the trials and tribulations of his well-known family. And you know, it's real good to watch because it comes on on Showtime after 10 p.m. <laughs> History doesn't recount who gave Cesare syphilis, but we do know when and where he got it. 
In the summer of 1497, he was a young 22-year-old cardinal sent by his pope father to crown the king of Naples and broker a royal marriage with his sister. Naples at the time was a city rich in convents and brothels, so a real fertile juxtaposition of the Renaissance male imagination. But it was also ripe with disease. We think syphilis actually originated in humans in the Americas, and two years before Cesare traveled to Naples, there was a group of French mercenary soldiers back from the New World that dallied in Naples a while to celebrate their victory. And they brought with them something unexpected from the New World, which was syphilis. And that's how syphilis moved from the Americas to Europe. So after Cesare accomplished his official business, he took to the streets. And following his tryst in Naples, a sore appeared on Cesare's penis, followed by a crippling pain throughout his body and an itchy rash. Fortunately for him and for history, his personal physician was a medical scholar with a keen interest in understanding this emerging new disease. And he used Cesare to record symptoms and also a bunch of attempted cures, which we now all have records of actually today. So pretty interesting stuff. Anyway, because of this connection to the French soldier, syphilis was coined as the French disease, a moniker that lasted for centuries. And here is an image of the poetic history of the French disease from 1686, so a couple hundred years after Cesare was hanging out in Naples. So people have been thinking about this for a long time. And from that point in history, syphilis remained in the consciousness of the sexually active, as we can see from these awesome propaganda posters. Treatment was discovered in the 1940s, but no real prevention strategies existed until condoms were regularly available, aside from avoiding the French. That was a joke. <laughs> but perhaps if Cesare's father had been a rabbi instead of a pope, his fate would have been a bit more favorable. In the mid-1850s, it was first noted that perhaps male circumcision could prevent syphilis when a physician in New York City observed that his male Jewish patients had less syphilis than his non-Jewish, presumably uncircumcised ones. And for the epidemiologists in the crowd, we can see here one of the first two-by-two -two tables, and disease is definitively on the top. And this is a screenshot of the actual monograph from the 1853 article. And since then, there have been numerous studies on the relationship between male circumcision and syphilis, with very consistent results that male circumcision reduces syphilis in heterosexual men. Now I want to highlight this point, that all previous studies investigate the protective effect in men, mostly heterosexual men, and not their female partners. And at this point, I've told you that research studies support male circumcision may prevent syphilis, but you still may be wondering how. So I'm going to walk you through that biological rationale in my next very serious slide. Have fun with me for a minute and pretend that there is something other than a banana under that peel. <laughs> If we pretend that this is a flaccid, uncircumcised penis, we can imagine the outer layer of the peel is like the outer layer of the foreskin. So more durable, like the skin on your arm or on your leg. And the inside of the peel or the inner layer of the foreskin is softer and wetter and easier for tears to occur. It's more similar to the tissue that's on the inside of your mouth and the skin on your arm. And it's easier for germs to enter that thin, moist layer of the foreskin. Now, when an uncircumcised penis becomes erect, it looks a lot less dramatic than this banana. <laughs> but the inner layer of the foreskin slightly inverts. So that less durable tissue is exposed during vaginal intercourse. And this creates an efficient way for bacteria and viruses to enter the body that cause sexually transmitted infections. And there's also some evidence that the cells that line that inner layer of the foreskin are actually more susceptible to sexually transmitted infections. And the rationale behind circumcision is that if we just remove the foreskin completely, we are minimizing the genital area where transmissions occur efficiently. And you'd be quite surprised at how easy it is to find a circumcised banana on the internet these days. <laughs> 
And this is the rationale for male circumcision's protective benefit, which carries over to other sexually transmitted infections too. For example, HIV. Researchers observed that countries in Africa with high HIV rates also had the lowest male circumcision rates. And here you see the countries on the left, and the darker colors are countries with the lowest male circumcision rates, and then countries on the right in the green and the yellow are countries with the highest HIV rates. And from that observation, many studies were conducted that actually found male circumcision to be protective against HIV among heterosexual men in Africa. And at the time, it was one of the first big breakthroughs in biomedical HIV prevention and very exciting as a potential game changer since studies showed circumcision could prevent HIV by up to 60% in heterosexual men. And subsequently, large-scale programs were rolled out campaigning for HIV-uninfected men to become circumcised to prevent HIV acquisition. Multiple studies across Sub-Saharan Africa, or multiple programs across Sub-Saharan Africa are still actively engaged in these campaigns, and they are almost universally part of countries' HIV prevention strategies in the region. And this is me as a young, earnest Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana, distributing condoms and demonstrating how to use them on large plastic vaginas. And at the time, encouraging adult heterosexual men to become circumcised was a huge HIV prevention campaign across the country. Now, Botswana was one of those countries in the dark green and yellow with an HIV rate of over 25% among adults. And in the context of low and middle income countries, male circumcision was prioritized for HIV uninfected men because the evidence was strongest for a benefit in that group. And there was limited resources for circumcision provision. Data on whether male circumcision prevented male to female transmission has been inconclusive to date. So essentially male circumcision was scaled up as an intervention with direct benefits only for HIV uninfected men. And this made me wonder, if male circumcision cannot confer a benefit for HIV prevention to female partners and men already infected with HIV, is there some other benefit for these populations, potentially other sexually transmitted infections maybe? So let's take a minute to regroup because we've covered a lot so far and things are about to get a little bit more complicated. So far we've learned that syphilis has been around for ages and the disease is especially bad for women because they can transmit it to babies. Evidence supports that male circumcision prevents HIV and syphilis in heterosexual HIV uninfected men based on all of that historic evidence that we've just gone over. And this led my research team to ask, can male circumcision also prevent syphilis in women and men already infected with HIV? So is there a non-HIV benefit for male circumcision in these populations? But how can we actually investigate this? And I'll add this caveat, how do we actually investigate this without circumcising people and then seeing what happens? And these types of studies where we don't do anything are known as observational studies because we're merely observing what happens and not intervening at all. One way we could do this is to take a defined population that has some people with the exposure that we're interested, in our case male circumcision, and some people with the outcome that we're interested in, like a sexually transmitted infection. Then we can compare whether there is more disease among uncircumcised men compared to circumcised men. However, we wouldn't really be able to discern which happened first. So perhaps they got syphilis and then became circumcised. We really wouldn't be able to tell with this kind of study. So what our team did was a prospective analysis, and I'm going to walk you through what that means. We took data from 4,700 Kenyan and Ugandan couples that reported having sex at least four times in the last month. They were all, all nearly married and about 30 years old. And since we were interested in the effect of male circumcision on syphilis among people already infected with HIV also, it was helpful to use a special kind of couple. And what was special about the couples that we looked at is that one partner was infected with HIV and the other was not. And this is known as HIV serodiscordance. So all of our couples were HIV serodiscordant. 
And from now on in our next slides, the red people will indicate those that are infected with HIV. And using HIV serodisc coordinate couples allowed us to look at each type of group separately. That way we could compare the effect of male circumcision or having a circumcised male partner on syphilis among people infected and uninfected with HIV and also men and women. We assessed via physical exam whether men were circumcised at the beginning of the study, so we knew definitively if men were circumcised and if women had circumcised partners. Then we followed everyone for three years, testing for syphilis each year and treating them if positive. So if we saw an infection in subsequent years, we assumed that was a new infection because everybody was treated if they had syphilis before and syphilis is entirely curable. We also assessed male circumcision status each year in case anybody became circumcised along the way. And then we calculated syphilis incidence rates. And incidence rates is a concept that's talked about a lot in the media, like the incidence of flu is higher than it was last year. But I'm gonna walk you through we actually arrive at such a figure. So using our study's example, we calculated the incidence of syphilis by counting up all the syphilis infections that occurred in every participant. So you could think about it as lining up each person that's in a study and then counting how many infections they had over the course of your study. So some people will have no infections, other people might have one or two or three. And then you do the same with the amount of time that everybody was in your study. Some people might have been there every day for the whole three years. Others might have left earlier. And you add that all up. And then you divide the number of syphilis infections you have by the amount of time. And that's how you arrive at your incidence rate. And since we wanted to compare the incidence between men that were circumcised versus uncircumcised, we calculated these incidence rates by circumcision status. And these little MC boxer shorts stand for male circumcision, so you can see it just snaps right on very easily. And we did the same for women and calculated their syphilis incidence by circumcision status of their male partners. And these colors are different for men and women on this slide because remember red means HIV infected and our couples were all HIV serodiscordant couples. So women have the opposite HIV status of their male partner here. Then we compared these incidence rates to see if male circumcision was associated with syphilis. And what we found was that among HIV infected men, those who were circumcised had 62% lower incidence of syphilis compared to their uncircumcised counterparts. And among HIV uninfected men, there was a 42% reduction in syphilis. We found a similar trend in female partners. Among HIV infected women with circumcised partners had 42% less syphilis than those with uncircumcised partners. And in HIV uninfected women, there was a 75% reduction in syphilis if they had circumcised male partners compared to uncircumcised ones. So these results are special for a couple of reasons. They're the first to compare male circumcision and syphilis incidence among women, and they are also the first to look at this in HIV infected men. We had a large number of people, which increases our confidence in these results. And if confirmed, our results suggest a promising additional benefit of male circumcision for both men and women. But before you all run out and tell your heterosexual male friends to become circumcised, there is a few limitations to consider. All of our couples in the study had one HIV infected partner. So would we see the same effect in entirely HIV uninfected couples or entirely HIV infected couples? You'd have to test that different study. Also, linking syphilis infections is not possible. So someone may have acquired syphilis from an outside partner that wasn't in the study, though we adjusted for this in sexual behavior in our statistics. We cannot generalize these findings beyond heterosexual African couples, and more research is needed to understand this relationship in other contexts. So to sum up, hopefully you'll leave here with an understanding of why it's important to prevent syphilis among men and women. I also hope you appreciate the colorful and interesting history of, of syphilis. And evidence supports that male circumcision may prevent some sexually transmitted infections, and hopefully you understand the rationale a bit, at least for syphilis, a bit better. 
and understand how scientists conduct research studies to investigate the public health impact of some interventions. I'd like to thank Town Hall for hosting all of my friends and I tonight. Thanks to Shelley and Juliana and the Engaged Science Program for teaching us and giving us this incredible opportunity. And thanks to my engaged classmates. I've never been so vulnerable in a classroom before, but I've also never had so much fun, and it's because of all of you. I work with the best mentors in the whole world, and without their endless generosity of support through my master's program and beyond, I would not have been introduced as a PhD student earlier this evening. <laughs> And lastly, thanks to all the study staff, study participants, and funders that make our work possible. Without them, these would have been some empty slides. So thank you, and now's the time when you can ask lots of questions. <laughs> Julia? How many incident cases of syphilis were there? Oh, good question. So in each category, so HIV infected and uninfected, people, there is over a hundred. So it's quite, quite a lot of power, I think, is what, is what you're getting at. I'm not sure the exact numbers off the top of my head. It was different in each category because there was more people in, in certain study populations. Yes? Uh, the study groups in Africa when you were there, were they more urban or rural? And, and also, were there any cultural elements that you had to overcome in So this was an observational study, so nobody was circumcised, and this is also a secondary data analysis from a different study that just happened to have information on participants' circumcision status and syphilis status over time. And I think the other part of your question is about people getting circumcised and what goes into that. And it's actually quite different than it is here in that it's massive public health intervention at this point. And it's also practiced quite differently than it is in the context of the United States. It actually came out of several tribes that practice it traditionally. and mostly as a rite of passage during adolescence. So it's more normal sounding um, that uh, adult male would consent to becoming circumcised in that context than, than here. Finny? So you said you accounted for people uh, getting syphilis outside of their relationship. How do you guys actually do that in the study? And how does that kind of come out of the numbers? Yeah, good question. So we can't really know if their infection came from someone else, but we can do two things to try and understand it more. One is to only allow syphilis infections to count in your statistical models if they are preceded by the partner having had a syphilis infection, if that makes sense. The other way we can do it is we asked everybody at every visit, did you have sex with an outside partner? And they were interviewed, the partners were interviewed separately. So if somebody said yes, then that was something that we put in our models to adjust for that. And we could sort of take the effect of that aspect out of the relationship between circumcision and syphilis. Jakes? Um, I just want to understand that you, your question was to verify whether or not there was uh, an impact on circumcision and the transmission and not to what extent that might be? Or did you also look into to what extent that it may reduce the transmission of syphilis to the two different populations? Yeah, so that's another good point. So epidemiologists get into these sticky situations where things are associated, but we don't want to say by how much because then we're held to a number. And so what we can definitively say with our results is that in this study population, we found this association and the association was this percent reduction in syphilis. And I would err to say that it's not really transmission that we were looking at, but rather acquisition because of that point, like I mentioned to Vinny, that we weren't really looking to see if the infection was being transmitted, but whether or not somebody got it. So it's just a way of how you kind of set up your math models. Great, I think I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs>